turn over with me to Daniel chapter 3. And uh, the brother mentioned this morning, he said, uh, he said um, he's talking about how sometimes as a preacher you think, well, uh, Lord, this isn't going to do any good. Why am I even up there preaching? Why don't you get somebody else? Uh, and I, I, I thought it was funny because I thought he got the same conversation I had in the plane right over here. Wow. <laughs> and then was, uh, Lord, are you sure, brother, uh, Gene isn't making a mistake? And, uh, but he, he mentioned all that, and his preaching has uh, blessed my heart, and Amen. all the preaching has blessed my heart. Amen. 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 Um, Amen. I love last night, uh, both men have preached, and uh, they hit just about everything. Amen. They hit it, kicked it, threw yeah. something out. <laughs> yeah, that's and, uh, good. God, how can I add to that? And yeah. you can't. You, you can't add to it. Uh, you can just go along with it. Amen. 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 And a lot of people want to mess things up when the Holy Spirit's moving. They want to add something to it. You don't need to add anything. Just go along with it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Just go along with the, with the flow. Amen. Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Daniel chapter number 3. The brother there preached uh, uh, kind of along the same lines. I'm not going to talk about what to do under judgment, but I'm going to talk about what to do under trials. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, children of Israel, here they are in bondage now. They are in Babylon. Uh, it's no longer where there, Jeremiah is preaching that, that judgment's come. Judgment's here. Yeah. As, as Brother already said, judgment's That's here. True. That we're in Daniel chapter three right now. Judgment's already here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so yeah. we want to learn something about uh, what to do in times of judgment. Look there in verse number um, fifteen. You know a lot of the background of this and what was set up by the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Look right. down in verse uh, number fifteen. It says, "Now you be ready that at what time you hear the sound." Uh, the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and also are all kinds of music. You shall fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast into the same hour to the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Uh, this ain't really in my notes, but I'll just throw this in there. It sounds an awful lot like an executive recommendation these days. Yeah. <laughs> you notice at the start of that verse, he oh, says, if you be ready at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of like if you're if you're willing to do it, we'd uh -huh. like you to do it. We'd like you to bow down. And at the end, he says, "We're going to kill you if you don't." Do that. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like yeah. how it used to be. You're allowed to wear a mask. We recommend it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's right. Right. but if you don't do it, we're going to shut your business down. That's we're right. Yeah, that's right. Come on. And uh, it's funny. Executive recommendations were back all the way to Daniel chapter three. Look there, verse sixteen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, "On Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter." I uh, mean, we're not, we're not unsure about what we're going to say. We know what we're going to say. Mm -hmm. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning uh, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image uh, which thou hast set up. Amen. Then uh, was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, the form of his visions was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, notice there, by the way, his visage was changed. The way that he looked at them changed. If they were willing to go along with him, everything would be all right. That's right. It was an early told him, they said, no, we're not going to go along with you. That his, the way that he looked at them changed. Yeah. And uh, Paul said, our church of Galatia, he said, uh, uh, who have bewitched you? He, uh, uh, he said, uh, am I an enemy? Have I become your enemy? Yeah. 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 Something that he said to him that didn't resonate with him. And folks, if you stand up for God, people are going to look at you different. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Their business yeah. is going to transform you. Yeah. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated, so seven times hotter. And he commanded the most mighty men that they were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them down into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down uh, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, uh, Do we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Uh, they have trouble counting, don't they? The simplest of things the world does. They answered and said unto the king, True king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and uh, the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was the hair of their heads singed, and neither were their coats changed, and nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. 
Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language uh, which speak anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And uh, God, we thank you so much, God, just to be able to come, just to be able to worship, Lord. Uh, God, I thank you, Lord, that there's another 7,000 that hasn't bowed their knee to Baal. Uh, God, I think there's another 7,000, Lord, that haven't bowed to the image. God, I thank you that there's people over here, Lord, in this area, God, that still stand for the truth, Lord, that still want you, God, to speak to them, God. And Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, you'd get me out of the way that you would do, do just that, Lord, you'd speak to your people. And God, I pray I wouldn't say anything that would displease you, God, but I pray you'd give me boldness, unction, power, wisdom, and discernment, God, to say everything you'd have me to say, Lord, to help your people. Get me out of the way, Lord, to lift up your son, Jesus Christ. I ask and pray in Jesus Christ's name, and amen. 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 This is a familiar story, and uh, it's a familiar story, and all of us have probably, all of us have heard messages on it or preached out of it at one point. And, uh, but like the preacher said this morning, you need to be reminded of those things because you're stupid. Amen. I wrote that point down in case I forgot it. Amen. <laughs> stupid. But uh, it's a simple story, but it's got a lot of great truths. Notice in verse number 15 uh, that his, uh, the question he asks is this. He says, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Notice this. It wasn't a sincere question. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's not asking the question saying, who is your God? I want to get to know him. He's insincerely asking the question. He's being sarcastic. And you know there's a lot of people today that are insincere whenever they ask the question, who is God? Who is the, the Lord God Almighty? Uh, old uh, Sleepy Joe there, he went to uh, the President uh, uh, Joseph Biden. He went to that, is it Episcopalian church? I don't know what it is, the day of his uh, coronation, or whatever they call that, that he did. Uh, he, he goes to that church, and he goes there, he has a little mask on, and they get up and do the, Oh, Father, blessed is it. Amen. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You ought to know I was the altar boy at my church, did you? But anyways, uh, uh, he, he gets up. Uh, he's not looking for God. He's not going there to actually seek who God is. You know a lot of people don't want to know who God is. Whenever you get an idea of who God is and what He's about, you got to change. And that's why most people, they're not asking sincerely, who is God? He says, who is this God that will deliver me or deliver you out of my hands? Can I say this? He found out by the end of the chapter who that God was. And I'll tell you this, every person, boy or girl, young or old, black or white, rich or poor, Muslim, uh, Christian, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, they're going to know who God is one day. You're better off meeting Him here than in eternity. You say, who's going to deliver you out of my hands? The same God that made your hands, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to be the one that's going to deliver them out of your hands. Verse number 12, I just want to, we didn't read it, but I want to bring uh, to your light that these are men. A lot of times we say that they were boys. It says uh, they were Jews, and it says these men, O king, have not regarded thee. A lot of times uh, people think that they were boys, they're men. But this dedication, this, this determination, this discipline that they had, it started as a young boy. And I'll say this, they didn't change over time. I thank God for people that don't change over time. They, they didn't change their grown men. That They stuck to what they believed. Verse 17 through 18, uh, he, they, they give him an answer. They say, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. And they give this answer. They say, King, uh, uh, if it be so, verse 17, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. So he's able. They believe that. They're sure of it. Yeah. And it says, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. Now, notice there, that's pretty positive. Yeah. They're not asking the question, man, I don't know if we're going to get through this. I don't know what, what, what's going to happen next. They're not, they're not in fear of it. They say, no, we know that God is going to deliver us. Yeah. Sure of it, man. Amen. But then they throw in a little disclaimer. Yeah. Amen. I hate disclaimers, amen. amen. Disclaimers are what keep you from being able to send the thing back once it's broke whenever you order online. Disclaimer. They put a little disclaimer down there. Look what it is. But if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now there are, just by way of introduction, there are all kinds of believers in the Bible, throughout your Bible. There's all, believers are different. You can look through here tonight and see that believers are different. Amen. We're all different. God uses us for different things, different tasks. Uh, some, some of us are rich, some are poor. Uh, there are some believers that are helpful. Some, some people just are helpful. There's some believers that are hurtful. All kinds of believers. There's tall believers, there's short believers. There's skinny believers and there's fat believers. Amen. <laughs> I didn't make eye contact with anybody whenever I said that. But, uh, 
There's some laid back believers, people that are just laid back in spirit, and there are what I call annoying believers. Amen. How many of you know an annoying believer? Amen. 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 Exciting believers, boring believers, smart believers, dumb believers. There's all kinds. There's sensible believers, there's weird believers. There's bold believers and there's meek believers. But I want to look at a very special kind of believer tonight. A very special kind of believer. It's one that I call a but if not believer. A but if not believer. I ask you the question now, I'm going to ask you at the end, are you a but if not believer? If so, do you want to stay a but if not believer? See, these uh, three Hebrew men, uh, they're not backing out of anything, they're not backing down from anything, and they're not backing away from anything. They're not backing up, they're not going anywhere. They're here to stay. Can I say this? We're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. These three Hebrew men knew that God could save them if He wanted to. But if He doesn't save them, they're still going to go on serving Him anyways. You know anyone can pray and serve God whenever He's answering all your prayers? Anyone can praise God whenever everything's good. Anyone can praise God whenever everything's going right in your life, whenever everything's the way that you want it, your family's the way that you, you want it, your finances are the way that you want it, your church is the way that you want it, the, the, the prayers that you're praying are all getting answered. Anybody can serve God that way. But what about whenever God doesn't deliver you? See, but if not, believer says, God, you can. Like they did, God, you can, but if not. God, you can fix my problems, but if not, I'm still going to stand up on Sunday morning and lift my hands up and say, glory to God, hallelujah. God, you can't heal my body. You can't heal my sick loved one in the hospital. But God, if you don't heal them, you're still the great physician. God, you can't get, change the government or the economy, but if not, God, I'm not going to quit on you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going anywhere, God. God, you could build up my church. You can build up my ministry, God. But God, if another, if another soul never walks through the door, if I never see anyone else saved, God, I'm going to go on being faithful. God, you can, whatever it is, God, you can give me victory over this sin or, or, or not. God, you, you can give me victory over this sin, but if not, I'm going to go on anyways. Can I just pause right here? You want to know why a lot of people... Now, some of, some of you aren't going to like this, but this is my own thing. And if it's wrong, the pastor will clean me up. Amen. He can I'll give me something to teach on. Amen. To his church. But a lot of people get out of church because they can't get victory over a sin. The worst thing for you to do whenever you're sick is to stop taking your medicine. And over there, I'm not a farmer, but over there in Hebrews uh, 12, I believe it says, it says, let, uh, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with us so easily beset us. Lay it aside. Now, I'm, I'm not a, I don't garden or anything like that, but I know this. If you're trying to plow up some land to plant a garden or you're just trying to dig a trench or whatever it is, if you come to a stump that's taking up all your time, sometimes you just got to go around it Amen. and leave the stump there. You can come back to that stump later. You know what you got to do if you're dealing with sin in your life? You say, God, I can't get victory over it. I can't get victory over it. Say, God, you can give me victory over it. I believe you can give me victory over it, God. But if not, I'm not going to get out of church. I'm not going to quit reading my Bible. I'm not going to quit being faithful. I'm going to keep going on until you, I'll come back to it and you give me the victory later. But if not, believer. God, you could bring my prodigal son home. God, you could bring my prodigal granddaughter home. God, you could bring my wife back into the house of God and I could sit with her in church again like we used to. God, you could get my mother and father in church. You could say my mother and father. God, you could do that. You can do that, God. But if not, I'm not going to quit on you. Job 13, 15 said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I maintain mine own ways before him. That's a but if not believer. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Yeah. David said in Psalms 119, It is good for me that I have been afflicted and that I might learn thy statutes. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments, listen, thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. He said, Thy judgments are right. You know what Abraham asked God? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yeah. Now you've got to think about something, folks. God makes decisions. If you're in a position of leadership or management or whatever it is, you've got to make decisions all the time. And you know this, you're going to make one group mad and one group happy. Or if you're in a Baptist church, you're just going to make both groups mad. <laughs> and uh, you think about this now. I want you to think about it. I, can't, I don't even have enough time to delve into it. But you think about all the decisions that God makes. 
God's making decisions right now on he's going to die, she's going to live, he's going to get cancer, I'm going to cure their cancer, uh, I'm going to take him out, I'm going to move him over there, he's going to lose his job, he's going to get that job. He's going to take over that church. He's going to leave that church. He's going to be a missionary. She's going to do this. He's going to do that. You think of all those decisions. He's going to be president. He's not going to be president. He's going to be king. He's not going to be king. You think of all that, and folks, think about this. He's never made one wrong decision. He's, he's never messed up. And folks, in your and I's life, he never makes a wrong decision. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Uh, but if not, believer says, God, no matter how this works out, you're still God and you're still right. And I'll say this, I'm talking about but if not moments, they will come. Yes. Yes, they will. The key is to be prepared before they come. Amen. Amen. Be prepared before they come. So Aaron, what does it take to be a but if not believer? What, what, what qualities does it take? What characteristics does it take? I'm going to give you three things and we'll be done. Number one, if you're going to be a but if not believer, you have to resolve to stay thankful. Resolve to stay thankful, determined not to get bitter. You know these three Hebrew men, they never did get bitter at uh, Daniel. Regardless of what Dr. Ruckman's uh, commentary Bible says on page 1141, comment 3. I'm going <laughs> to preach it. So, some of you are looking down at your Bible right now seeing what he said. He said this. He said he believed, he said maybe, he said if, he said if, if, if chapter 2 verse 49 is as accurate that David sat in the gate, he said David may have been there when Nebuchadnezzar, uh, whenever the king made this decree, and he just didn't say anything. I'm going to say the opposite. I'm going to say David wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say, amen? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but anyways, uh, think about this. They didn't do this. They didn't say, hold on, king, hold on, king, hold on for just a second. We got to talk over here. We got to commune. <laughs> hey, fellas, Shadrach, Meshach, where's David at? Or where's Daniel at? And they said, oh, you didn't hear about Daniel? Oh, yeah, he's up in his luxury home. He's taking it easy. Oh, you didn't hear about him? Oh, yeah, he, he's taking it easy, man. He's compromised. He's went out of the way. And then old Shadrach goes, you didn't hear what happened? The king bowed down to him, and he didn't even tell him to get up. He's living in sin, man. You didn't hear what happened to him? You didn't hear, brother? About what happened to pastor so-and-so? How he got messed up in sin? I heard this about Daniel. I heard he doesn't even pray anymore. You notice they didn't do that? You know, you've got to be careful looking at other people and comparing your problems to their problems. You know Daniel's going to be tested. Daniel's faith is going to be tried. His is just a little bit different. You know, Daniel got in trouble for bowing. These three men got in trouble for not bowing. They were both tested on a similar basis, a similar concept. Are you going to bow? Daniel got in trouble because he bowed. They got in trouble because they didn't bow. You know, not everybody has to respond the same way to trials. You know, you can get in trouble thinking, uh, well, if they just would have done it this way, it would have turned out different for them. If they, just would, if, they, if they wouldn't have said that, or if she wouldn't have said that, or if they would have just raised their kids differently, or this way, or that way, or if he would just pastor his church this way, it all would have turned out, no, you don't know how God wants them to respond. You don't know how God wants them to act, what decisions they need to make. Whether by fire or by lions, every man is tested. Daniel's going to be tested down the road as well. Both were tested on a similar basis. Don't assume you know the reason why someone is, being, uh, is going through tribulations. Don't assume that everyone else should respond the same way. And Daniel 3, uh, uh, the king, he, uh, he makes that fiery furnace there. And if you notice, it's kind of out of nowhere. It's kind of a random rule. He just says, I'm going to make up a rule that if we play this music, you don't bat on this, this statue, uh, we're going to throw you into a fiery furnace. Kind of comes up out of nowhere. Their clothes are still on when they go into the furnace. Kind of showed up out of nowhere, didn't it? Fiery trials will show up out of nowhere. It just takes one phone call. It takes you coming home from work one day and hearing some news that will flip your world around. But they determined before it ever came up that they were going to stay on God's side. They would not bend. They would not bow. They did not get bitter. And as Brother Noel said in one of his messages I listened to, they would not boogie. Amen. They said, we're going to play some music. We want you to boogie like us. And they said, nope, we're not going to boogie. Amen. And therefore, they did not burn. The fire that, I remember, I'm talking about being thankful, resolved to stay thankful. The fire that burned up others did not burn them up. And bitterness will burn you up. Bitterness will burn you up, burn you out, and break you down. 
Bitterness will rob you of God's blessings. Bitterness will keep you from enjoying the blessings of God because you're bitter about something. I'll say this, I, I, work with, uh, I worked in Columbus there for almost four years at an inner city church. Uh, we had a men's rehabilitation home there. We worked with a men uh, struggling with uh, addiction and uh, different things like that and uh, homelessness. And then we had six meal services a day where they'd come in and listen to preaching first and then they could get a free meal. They'd listen to preaching first. And they'd always, someone would always come in and go, oh, Jesus didn't turn anybody away. Well, he preached to them for three days before he fed them. <laughs> so we would preach to them. And uh, that's just the work. I did that for a couple years, and Lord willing, we're going to start another work like that soon here. Uh, but I would, man, I would, uh, those guys, they'd come in, and we had men sent from all over Texas and Alabama, Louisiana, and different places. And uh, a lot of times, I, they, I, I was the director of the men's home there for about two and a half years. And man, some of the things that those guys have been through, I mean, some wild stuff, stuff I wouldn't tell you, uh, but just some wild stuff. And uh, they came from everything from sticking needles in their arms to being felons and uh, everything else. Uh, and they just had a rough background. But I'll say this, uh, you know bitterness destroys way more people than booze and drugs do. You know, about, I'd say about 99% of the people in here tonight, you're not tempted with alcohol. And you're not tempted with dope. But I've seen bitterness destroy more Christian homes than anything else. A wife that's bitter about her husband... A husband that's bitter about his wife. Children that are bitter about their parents. That they don't make as much money as the other kids do in church. Or they don't, they don't get to go to the other places that the other kids do in church. Bitterness will destroy more homes than dope ever will. And you have to determine in your heart that you're going to stay thankful to God. And you're not going to get bitter. You're not going to get mad at God. You're not going to get resentful towards God. Be thankful for your family. Be thankful for your friends. Be thankful for faithful servants of God. You ought to be thankful for this church. Amen. Resolve to stay thankful. I want to hurry along here. Number two, if you're going to be a but if not believer, you've got to resolve to stay thankful. Number two, you've got to realize that it's only temporary. Amen. Realize that it's only temporary. These men are going to burn to death, or supposedly. And uh, burnings could last depending upon how, they, how, you, how you burn somebody. Uh, not that I've ever done it, but this is how you can do it different ways. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but... Uh, I guess it depends on how you want them to taste when it's all said and done. Uh, it could last up to seven hours to burn alive. But this furnace was seven times hotter than usual. It was around seven to 9,000 degrees probably. So they would have burned up in less than two minutes. And their nerve fibers that would allow them to feel that, with probably within about 30 seconds, would have been singed off. My point is this, is it, kind of, it wouldn't have lasted that long. Now, I'm not saying I want to be burned to death, but I'm saying this. Think about 30 seconds. Could you endure pain for 30 seconds? You ever have a trial in life that you feel like it's never going to end? And then years later, you look back and you really don't even remember why you're so upset about it. You thought in the moment, man, this isn't going to end. This is going to last forever. And then years go by, time goes by, and you look back and someone brings it up or your wife, somebody just mentions it or something says, do you remember this or do you remember when that happened? And you start thinking, you're like, man, I don't remember why I was so upset about it. Yeah. You all ever have anything like that? Big, big things. <clears throat> you thought you were not going to get through them. You thought this is it. I'm talking about you're getting ready to go out on a date and you got a big old zit on your nose. <laughs> Those real bad, life-altering, traumatic things. <laughs> Amen. It was real serious. Your dad came up to you in church and embarrassed you in front of your boyfriend or something. I'm talking about those real serious things. No, I, I'm just joking, but really. Remember, God called you to service and you thought, God, I can't do this. Remember, you went through a financial problem and you thought, God, I'm not going to make it through this. You went through a health problem, whatever it is, whatever, whatever trial, and you said, God, I don't think I'm ever going to make through this. I'm looking at you tonight and you're here. As far as tonight goes... It's a 100% success rate for everybody in here. Amen. Right. Right. I mean, the CDC can fudge their numbers. We're going to fudge ours a little bit. Amen. I mean. <laughs> Just like the COVID's a 100% death rate, it's a 100% success rate for everybody in here. I mean, we're all doing good. Realize, you won't, realize this, you won't remember it in eternity. You're not even going to remember it. Revelation 21, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them. Amen. Amen. 
Can't wait till he's here himself. Amen. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor there shall be any pain. For the former things are passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Isaiah 65, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former earth shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Spiritual Alzheimer's. Amen. You won't remember. And think about this. Jesus Christ left all that He had in heaven to come down and live like He did. You ever wonder how in the world I'm talking about a God? Folks, you gotta, you gotta, we can't understand because we don't have a monarchy or anything like that, but I got a little glimpse of it tonight, amen, what it's like around His throne, just a little bit. But you got to understand, folks, He's sitting around His throne, and He has seraphims and cherubims that are just floating. Just floating in the air going, holy, holy, holy. holy. they got six wings with twain they cover the face. I mean, I, heads like eagles and all that. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. They're singing to Him, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah. I mean, He left all that and came down here. And you say, Aaron, how did he go through that? You ever tried comparing 33 and a half years to eternity? If all, if all this, if all these walls and all this color is eternity, and you want to compare 33 and a half years, and I'm going to defile the house of God. I'm going to make a little mark. But that right there is 33 and a half years. Your problems will pass. The trying of your faith is precious. Talking about trying of the faith, I wish I could park here. I'm not going to do it too long. But you notice he said seven times hotter? Yeah. Bless his heart. Don't he know what seven means? Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't study numerology, amen? He didn't go to PBI. Seven's perfection. It's making something better. Uh, you know Samson's head had seven locks in it? You know, Samson's, uh, or his hair had seven locks in it. His hair was a strength. You want to know where the Philistines messed up at? They shaved his head. You know what happens when you shave something? It grows back thicker. You know what happens when your enemy comes against you and they heat up the furnace seven times hotter? God's using them to perfect you. And I'll say this, it may get you in this life. Maybe it takes you out, I don't know. But I know this, whenever you come back, you're going to be stronger and better than ever. Amen. That's good, brother. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Realize it's only temporary. Amen. I can't sing, but there's that one song I like to sing. I sing because I like to sing, not because I'm a good singer. But <clears throat> there's that one song. Uh, there's this longing in my heart for His appearing. I'll gladly leave behind these trials here below. For this journey has been hard and I'm so weary. But Lord, I feel I'm so much closer to my home. And just any day now, our Lord is coming. He'll be returning for you and me. Oh, I've been watching and I've been waiting. And just any day now, His face I'll see. Realize it's only temporary. Just any day now, the Lord has come back. Number three, what do you need to be a but-if-not believer? I don't know about you, but I want to be a but-if-not believer. I want to last, man. I want to last. Number one, resolve to stay thankful. Number two, realize it's only temporary. Number three, remember it's not about you. It's about them. Remember, it's not about you, it's about them. You say, what do you mean? When you go through a trial, the trial isn't just about you. Someone else is watching you and learning how a Christian ought to handle trials and tribulations. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, the fire wasn't just for the three Hebrew men to be thrown into, but it was for the unbelieving king, the nation, and other believers. Did you notice this? When the king looked in, he said, I thought I threw in three, but there's more in there than what I, I thought. You ever notice this when you're street preaching? The way the world looks at you. Uh, you'll be on one corner and you'll be passing out a track. And, uh, or someone is passing out a track down the road, I guess, from you. And, and you're on the next corner. And somebody will come by and you offer them a track. And they go, no, I don't want one. And they, when they walk by, they say this. They go, man, those guys are everywhere. <laughs> no, we're not. There's just three of us, Hoss. You, 
You've been learning to count by the CDC and who? You're exaggerating the numbers. They saw, they saw Jesus Christ. Uh, they, they, they saw more than uh, what was there. They, they finally, for the first time, saw Jesus Christ. And folks, people need to see Jesus Christ through your trials. He said over in Isaiah 48, everybody talks about, I want to be with God, I want to be with God. The three Hebrew men found out that God is in the fire. Amen. Isaiah 48, 9 through 10 says, For my name's sake I will defer my anger, and for my praise will I re refrain for thee, that I will not cut thee off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. You want to get closer to the Lord? He's still in the fire. The time you'll see God the Moses in trials. But you have to be willing to go through the fire to get there. Why is it important to be a but if not believer? What are, why are these but if not moments important for us? Daniel chapter 3, you've got to get this. This is real deep. Real deep. Hey, maybe we're going to dive real deep here. Daniel chapter 3 wasn't written for these three Hebrew men. God didn't have this recorded for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, they weren't going to bless God. You remember when we stood up to the king? That, that's not what this was for. It was for the people coming after them. That's good, Amen. Amen. Can I just be real with you? You want to know why God lets you struggle at your church? Because there's a generation of preachers coming up behind you. And we don't get to be in the glory days. We don't get to see churches of 500 boom like that overnight. We don't get to see those things. We don't get to go out and knock on doors and see a person saved every single week. But we need to see how a man of God stands up and he's faithful day in and day out. And he's faithful to his people and he doesn't get discouraged. And he, whenever he is discouraged, he goes on and he goes through it and he handles it. You know why God lets you deal with the problems you deal with it with your family? Because there's someone else that's going to have those same problems come up in their marriage, in their home. And they've got to know how to handle it. Your problems is not about you, it's about others, it's about them. And the others need an example. Uh, my uh, wife and I, uh, we just had a son uh, back in October 6th. Amen. He's two months old. He's still got the new baby smell. Amen. <laughs> the good one and the bad one. Got both of them. And uh, we named him Stephen Brett. Stephen, it's spelled like in the Bible with a PH. And then he's named after Stephen uh, the, uh, the uh, martyr. And then he's also named after my father, Stephen. And then his uh, middle name is Brett. And uh, he's named Brett after a man named Brett Crabtree. Uh, how many of you know Brett Crabtree? No. He graduated from PBI years back. And uh, the reason why you don't know him is he stayed there in Columbus in the ghetto in the bottoms ministering there at the mission, charity mission. Um, Pastor Jimmy Hood started it. And he's been back there for uh, over 20 years now, I believe, 25, 30 years. And uh, uh, whenever I started taking over the men's home, uh, Pastor Joe was going to give it to Brother Crabtree and say, Brother Crabtree, I want you to direct it now. And Brother Crabtree said, no, I think you ought to let Brother Aaron do it. And he wasn't saying that disrespectfully. He, he saw my passion for it. He saw my zeal for it. And he, he wanted me to do it. But he was my mentor, man. I can't tell you how many times I went in there to his, his uh, little apartment there, his little uh, apartment, and talked to him, man. He, he'd advise me on stuff. And you've got to understand, Brother Crabtree, he's, he's kind of crazy. He's a crazy guy. Um, he, has a, he has a Fu Manchu. Nothing against Fu Manchus. But a lot, a lot of the brethren don't like it. Now, his goes down a little extra. He's got a little extra. And he wears black Harley Davidson boots. He used to be a biker. He used to be in a biker gang. And uh, he's got tattoos from his old lifestyle on his fingers and on his knuckles and on his hands. Um, he wears a couple different rings on his finger. I know some of you don't like that either. He wears a couple different rings on his finger. Uh, he always dresses in uh, black pants and sometimes his shirt's different colors. I, mean, I don't agree with him doctrinally on that. You've got to have a white shirt to be a preacher. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, but he, he's an uh, ordinary man. He'll say things and he'll get you going. He'll, he'll just say things and... Uh, He's or he, I love him, though. He, he likes to stir up trouble, but he knows how to comfort. Anyways, the, the thing I'm getting to is this. Is, uh, he told me a story a while back there, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Him and his wife, they were married and everything. They had boys, they had children. They went there to the mission. They were there for a couple years. And he said he would preach at the meal services. And if you ever preached, if you preach to anybody, you know how it can be discouraging. You know, you preach to people and they don't change. But it can be really discouraging when you're dealing with that crowd. Uh, because they, you know, for you it's so simple, like, you know, just get help. Why can't you just get help? And, and so it can be discouraging, so you don't always want to preach it anyways, but he goes to the doctor one day, he's been having pain there in his throat, and they do the, the scans there and everything, and the doctor comes back and they say, he says, Brett, I got your, your scans. He said, I got some bad news for you. He said, Brett, you got cancer. Uh, you got cancer up here in your neck. And he said, uh, it spread a little bit, we're going to have to take it out, we're going to have to have surgery, and, um, and he got that news, and uh, Brother Crabtree, you know, he went home, and uh, 
he, he went home and when he walked through the door, he said he walked through the door and he said all the luggage was all packed. He said, honey, he said, what's going on? She came out of the hallway and she goes, Brett, I'm leaving you. And he's, he's talked to her. He said, why are you leaving? And she said this and that. I can't handle it anymore. I can't handle this work. I can't handle this ministry. I can't handle being married anymore. I, I need a break. I need to get away from all this stuff. And, and she said, Brett, and she said, I'm taking uh, Elijah and I'm going, we're going up north to live with my mom. And he said he watched as his little boy, his 12-year-old boy, 11-year-old boy, I guess an 8-year-old boy at that time, would take the bags out one by one and put them up in the car. And he watched his wife as she packed up that car. And she drove off and drove away. And he was supposed to preach that night at the meal service at 6 o'clock. And he said he remembered he just did the only thing that he knew to do. He said he went in and got on his dress pants. He said he went and got on his shirt and his tie. And he said he got his Bible together. And he didn't want to go over there early this time. He said he, and he said he got to that door. And he came up to that door and he said he put his hand on it. He said he bowed his head at the door and he thought this to himself, God, why? God, why? You know what he did next? He opened up the door, he walked next door, and he preached to a bunch of drunks and homeless and told them about Jesus. You say, what did he do? He kept on going. He kept on going. And you know what, Aaron Kogel, you know what I do sometimes whenever I don't feel? Like preaching? When I don't feel like going to the nursing home and visiting somebody, when I don't feel like going to the hospital and visiting somebody, whenever I'm tired or weary, you know what I think of? I think of Brother Crabtree. Yes. Yes. I think, would he do it? Would he, would he keep going on? Yes. He told me the other day, he said, uh, Brother Aaron, he said, I don't even know why God keeps me around anymore. He has fluid on his lungs and it's building up and he can't hardly preach anymore, he can't hardly teach anymore. Man, he used to love to teach several times a week there, Bible studies and different things, and he can't do it anymore. He says, Aaron, I don't even know why I'm around anymore. I don't even know why God keeps me around. And, and I said this, he, he sits there with oxygen because he, uh, you got to keep, keep this in mind. Uh, he's got oxygen there going through his nasal canyon, through his nose that he has to carry around now. And um, he, just, he just doesn't have energy, he doesn't have strength anymore. He's only in his 50s, I believe. And, and uh, I told him this, I said, Brother Crabtree, he keeps you around for people like me. You're showing me how to finish. And folks, God pe God's people need someone to show them how to finish. I'm going to have you turn to one place and we're going to be done. I want, I want you to turn over to Mark chapter 14. A but if not moment. Mark chapter 14. You know, Jesus Christ had a but if not moment in his life. Mark chapter 14, verse 35, And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible. Mark 14, verse 35, He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto, unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Jesus Christ said, God, I know that you're able to do all things. He said, but nevertheless. That was his but if not moment. And you say, Aaron, why did he go through his but if not moment? See, it wasn't about him. It was about you and 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 you. And your but if not moment's not about you, it's about others. We need, uh, don't forget folks why we're in this thing. We're in it for the Lord and we're in it for each other. Yes. Amen. It's, time, it's time to determine that we're here to stay regardless of how things go. We have to stick together. Quit splitting up with people over stupid stuff. Yes. And how they react to their trials and their temptations. Amen. And whether or not they bow or don't bow. And this evening you may be saying, maybe it's your time tonight to say, God, you can, but if not, I'm not going to quit. Amen. Maybe someone in here tonight is considering quitting. Maybe you'd like to determine now, God, I don't know what you have in store for me, but God, I want to be able to go through the fire whenever it comes. Yeah. Amen. Determine your heart tonight. Resolve to stay thankful. Remember it's only temporary. Realize it's not about you. It's about them. And if you do these things, you'll, you will be rewarded for your trial. Yeah. You know how it all ended? A king told him to come up hither. Amen. And he rewarded him. I want to have something where he says, come up hither. Someday my life will end. I'll hear a sweet sound. Saying, child, enter in. You've won your crown. Amen. 
And though I don't deserve such mercy and grace, here's what I'm going to do when I see His sweet face. I'm going to lay my crown at the Master's feet. And then I'll bow down as they crown Him King of Kings. I'll shout hallelujah, my joy is complete. When I lay my crown at the Master's feet. Don't you want a crown? Amen. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, God. Thank you for being good to us, Lord. And God, I pray, Lord, tonight... God, you'd help some people in here to determine that they're going to go on for you. Uh, Lord, maybe you're asking them to step out by faith and do something, Lord, and they don't understand why. Uh, God, they don't understand how it's all going to work out or if it's going to work out. God, I pray tonight, God, they'd say, but if not, I'll go on and do it anyways, Lord. And God, I pray, Lord, you'd help your people, Lord, tonight, God, to help us, Lord, to be resolved. God, help us to be determined, Lord, to stay in it, Lord, to stay with it, to stay together, Father, as those three Hebrew men did. God, help us to stay together, Lord. We love you. We thank you and praise you, Lord. I pray you bless the pastors he moderates, Lord. Bless the people down here praying. God, we love you and thank you. Ask all this in Jesus Christ's name and amen.